All right, this seems to be working. So today um, we're going to follow up what we talked about last time by talking about mixing. And um, I know this sounds like something you already have plenty of experience with. We all mix stuff at home. But this is a mixing that's unlike anything you do at home. I have a Vitamix at home. It makes great smoothies. Um, but it's just a, a blade. It spins. All right, it does a great job for what I needed to do. But it couldn't do what we needed to do for CIM. All right, those types of mixtures, um, as, as hopefully you'll kind of comprehend, don't really mix at all for as far as what we need. All right, uh, so the kinds of things we're talking about, the entire industry of metal injection molding and ceramic injection molding would not exist if we relied on the Vitamixer and blades like it. All right, so yes, you've, you've seen the phrase mixing before, but this is not mixing the, as you know it at all. I don't, I mean, a video I'll show you that is also on the, the um, Carmen page that um, will hopefully give you an idea of what really mixing means in this context and uh, we'll talk about why that level of effort and energy and uh, materials innovation is necessary to get to the, the point of allowing us to injection mold things. All right, and so we have a lot of goals for mixing in this context. And um, uh, as you should hopefully certainly realize, this is driven by the mechanical properties needs of what it is we're making. Um, there might be an extra handout over there if you need it. You guys are good? All right. Um, and so we're trying to make the, the flaws as small as possible. That's the driving force for all of this, along with the fact that we're trying to make a mixture that goes through tiny, tiny gates and gets into the mold, all right? And so those are a couple of challenges. In order to make all this work, um, first off, we need to have a homogeneous mixture, which means we have to take all these binders and plasticizers and uh, processing additives as part of the story and get those to homogeneously mix with the particles. And in order to make that successful, we must think about getting rid of agglomerates. And so uh, I mentioned this last time. Um, what we start out with is an agglomerate. So this is this is in the bag. So you get this bag of alumina that's shipped to your plant, or more likely a 55 gallon drum of alumina, and that drum consists of our alumina particles as as tiny little specks inside these large agglomerates. And I, showed you some pictures of those things before. So these agglomerates can be hundreds of microns in size and it's not alone inside that 55 gallon drum. It's got other agglomerates and these are what we call hard agglomerates. It's one of these words that people made up and reflects the fact that these particles are sitting there in the air and they have fallen into the energy well and they can't get out. All right, Not on their own at least. Right, so these guys are, are literally stuck to each other via these very strong van der Waals hydrogen bonding forces. And so those are agglomerates that we are initially trying to get rid of and then um, eventually we'll transition to what's called soft agglomerates and we'll talk about what that means. We've kind of already mentioned it before. Things in the way that I'll keep these particles from falling into the hard, the hard agglomerate state or falling into that energy well. And so this allows us to do a couple of things. Ultimately, a high density as possible. Why do we like really high densities? High density means what? What's the good thing about high density? Huh? Say what? Oh, I'm talking about the final uh, centered density. That's really what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's Less valuable, less valuable, like flaw space, higher density? Yeah, high density, yeah. Less, less flaw space, but also smaller flaws. Right. Um, and that's all a big part of this. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that flaw size is the governing thing. So if I have, if I have uh, and you'll see this, you can buy ceramics and stuff, and they'll say, oh, it's 99% dense. All right, and that sounds good. That's a good number. Um, but at 1% porosity, if that exists in the form of a 100 micron pore inside the overall ceramic, that is way, way, way worse than you have that one, same 1% 1 porosity as uh, one micron pore is distributed all the way throughout. All right. 
And so the number on the outside doesn't tell you what kind of mechanical strength you're going to get, but we all now know that the size of the flaw is the key aspect of this, and driving that flaw size down is usually achieved by driving the density as high as we possibly can. And that's all part of what we're doing here and worrying about mixing. So we must optimize the mixing conditions, determine the factors that affect performance, um, and um, this all relates to the final goal here. We also think about segregation and mixing, and then when enough is enough. How do we know if the mixture is homogeneous? You know, have we gotten, have we poured enough energy, time, and money into this process of mixing to get to a good end state? And in many cases, uh, you can't just, you can't put a number on it. There's no device that says, okay, you're there. What, means, what it means is you start making parts and you find out if they're good enough. And if they're not, you go back, throw away all those parts, and start over again and mix for longer. That's really the only way of, of getting there. But um, part of that does involve looking at this, but beyond a certain point, you know, visual stuff and the kinds of analyses that we can do are not enough. We'll talk about some of that here. Okay, so mixing, again, not what you do at home, um, involves the transport of material in the mixture to produce a desired spatial arrangement of the individual components. All right, spatial arrangement. So this means we're trying to get the soft agglomerates, we're trying to mix polymers and ceramics together. Those two don't like each other, all right? And so we have to bring in processing additives which allow the alumina and the polymer to get along at that interface and form a continuous blend there. This transport occurs on different scales, and we'll talk a lot about scales today because there's the visual side of things and there's mixing at multiple levels, all right? And this relates back to shearing as I talked about last time, so we're gonna learn a lot about shear today. And uh, as a part of that, the, the forces that are applied in these systems are going to be radically different depending on the type of shearing or mixing that we're using. And so there's the kind of mixing that we're used to, which is diffusive mixing. Molecules initially separated will commingle mix as a consequence of both the concentration gradient and random molecular processes. All right, so we put salt in water, all right, eventually the salt will diffusively mix with the water, all right, because it goes away, goes, falls down the concentration gradient, and eventually, at some point after equilibrium is reached, you've got this uniform result. Um, but the process occurs on too small a scale to mix an entire batch. And when we're talking about batch, we're talking about what we're dealing with. There's huge chunks of ceramic, which have no reason to follow a concentration gradient. And then you have polymers, which, you know, if, you're, if you go to high enough temperature, they might actually start to follow a concentration gradient. But normally, um, it's not going to happen. They just, even at 200 degrees, they don't really diffuse much because they're long chain matter. And so this is not salt and water. These are these uh, technological barriers are much more severe and so what we think of as being useful for salt and water is used less for these types of mixes that we're talking about in terms of ceramic particles and, and polymer components. And so we know that the components must be put into motion by some external agent, and I'll show you that movie in a minute. In ceramic injection molding, the fluid velocity, viscosity, I'm sorry, is so high um, so we just had this discussion about packing density, remember? We're trying to get to 74, 75, 80% fluid density and still have a fluid that moves and goes through tiny holes and so forth. All right, so, whoa, what did I do? Nothing. Um, and um, this high packing density means that we have a really high viscosity, okay? And this is, uh, again, that, so it's a phenomenal thing getting to 80% solids density and still having a movable fluid. But the, the flip side of that is, of course, the viscosity can be enormous all right, because you're, you're moving solid alumina. All right? And so it's unsurprisingly, the viscosities can be pretty darn high. And so um, what we think about is using something called laminar mixing. Now, um, this is a little confusing because as you might know, you can get laminar mixing pretty easily just by flowing water over a, a solid. Um, and um, what we have to do is use laminar mixing intelligently. And so you might think that in order to mix things, you want to get turbulent mixing, which some of you might have seen before. And turbulent is just this high energy fluid going in all directions. Um, 
think about wind and, and water undergoing turbulent mixing. But these guys, we're talking about A, solid alumina, which doesn't really care very much about turbulence. And then you also have a high viscosity polymer. All right, so if you try to make turbulent mixing happen in a polymer at a molten state, it just dies off right away. It doesn't go very far, all right, because it's a heavy viscosity. It doesn't change much. And so what we think about is using laminar mixing, and this increases the ramness of the particle system without typically reducing their size. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're thinking about this relationship. So some of you have seen this before. This is flow, all right, through a, through a tube or down a channel or what have you. Uh, what is the velocity at the wall? Zero. Zero, all right. It is not moving at the wall, especially for polymers. They're stuck on the wall. They're not going anywhere. And so as we move away from that wall, we know that the velocity increases. It must because flow is occurring down this channel and it reaches some maximum V sub m in the middle there, which is all well and good. Um, but what we do in the context of trying to make mixing happen is we have control over the exterior, essentially. So we have, let's just go ahead and make this solid move that way and make that wall move that way. So now we're not talking about a, a pipe anymore, or a tube, we're talking about two plates or two objects that are going in different directions. And so what does that mean? It means, of course, that these guys are actually now moving this way. I'm going to try to change the arrowheads here on these things. All right, and so what happens is, and just you know, cross those out, what happens is these sets of arrows, they meet in the middle, all right? And where they meet, we have shear. And as you'll see, we have drag forces. Okay, and so this is how we can take simple laminar mixing, which on the face of it sounds useless, and by causing two laminar, laminar flow profiles to interact, to intersect here, we generate huge amounts of mechanical force that reaches down to the, the uh, micron level and can destroy agglomerates. In fact, it can destroy polymers. You can, you can cause the molecular weight of the polymers to decrease if you shear them hard enough. All right, and so this is, this is a key component of, of making this work. This is not something that you guys have at home unless you have a much better Vitamix than I do. So this is, this is the, the heart of how we use a, a laminar flow to cause binder components to pass from a less to a more homogeneous state. And that, when I say binder components, I'm including not only all the polymers, but also the ceramics that, that we're trying to generate a homogeneous state out of. And again, homogeneous states necessary to not only mix things together, but also to make sure they flow really well. All right. Any questions about this so far? So the most difficult step, um, should be unsurprising, the incorporation of the ceramic powder into the molten or dissolved organic binder. During this process, the agglomerates that already exist, all right, that's in the bag or in the, the drum, they are, they are hard agglomerates they are destroyed, at least hopefully they're destroyed. The relative motion between a particle and surrounding fluid tends to accelerate that particle. All right, and so we have these guys moving in a flow, and it's, there's another flow going in the opposite direction, and they, they fight, they intersect at that, where those two arrows going in a different direction. And that's where this, this shearing process, these drag forces are occurring. If we talk about perfectly spherical particles, um, do we still do that lab where we take metal spheres and drop them in oil and time the amount of time it goes it takes to fall through the column? Thank goodness we don't do that one anymore. Everybody hated that lab. Uh, that used to be something that we did a lot of um, for at least the first 15 years that I was here. They had that lab and you drop metal balls in oil and you click the time and get a Reynolds number. And anyway, but that's where Reynolds number um, comes in and this Reynolds number has to do with the characteristics of the liquid. And so we have the density, volume, um, and primarily the viscosity here. So Stokes' law predicts the drag force under these circumstances that is exerted on the particle is 6 pi r, which is the Reynolds number, which is a fluid characteristic, eta, which is the viscosity, and then v, which is the relative velocity between the fluid and the particle. 
And so what we're trying to do is exert an enormous amount of drag force on these particles at that interface between these two competing laminar flows. All right, and that's what, as I said, reaches down to the micron level and just rips everything apart. Hard agglomerates, polymers if you want it. I'm not doing anything here, why is it? Okay, all right, anyway, causes this mixing to occur, not only mixing polymers together, but solid particles and uh, the polymer phase around them. All right. Still defining mixing here. If the drag force is sufficient, it can destroy pre-existing agglomerates. So it can reach down into particles that are at the bottom of the energy well and rip them away from each other. All right. Overcoming this huge force that's trying to hold them together. On a practical basis, we interpret drag force as shear force because that's what we're doing mechanically on the outside. I'll, I'll show you the appropriate equipment here in just a second. High shear forces promote dispersion via dispersive mixing. Below a critical stress, dispersion does not occur. In other words, uh, the arrows aren't long enough, aren't a high enough uh, magnitude when those two flows interact, we don't get this process. So you need to have a certain amount of force involved. When the shear stress slightly exceeds a critical stress, only agglomerates with a favorable initial orientation will become dispersed. And so this is kind of goal setting here. So you know, this is just showing you kind of what I drew earlier the particles out of the bag um, and of course the the thing that we're concerned about which is why we do this first off is that there are big flaws here all right and these hard agglomerates they're stuck together this flaw size is not going to change because they're hard all right they're not going anywhere and so what we do with the process of mixing is first off we destroy those agglomerates but we also undergo dispersion and this is just one example of dispersion so you can see the particles are there and we're making what's called the soft agglomerate at this point. So each one of these you would think of as a soft agglomerate. And the space between them is now no longer empty, but it's occupied by the polymer phase, polyethylene, whatever we're dealing with, and processing additives and plasticizers and everything else is now in between them, keeping them from falling back into the energy well. They're still attracted to each other. That's why they have that arrangement in space, but now they're soft. And so that means that when we mold these together, they can collapse, they can kind of deform, and we don't end up with the same flaw size we started out with when hard agglomerates were involved. Okay, so everyone see that? A couple things. Alignment with the flow can protect the agglomerates. Um, for this reason, the mixers can be designed to constantly change direction. So you can, you can shear this way and then reverse and shear that way and try to catch agglomerates that are oriented favorably to avoid that, that band of shear between those two surfaces. Okay, so they're, they're on to what uh, these agglomerates will try to do to avoid being destroyed. And so this is a movie, hopefully. Um, first off, we'll start out with you know, the, the key aspect of this, which is what do these mixtures look like? I've been blabbering on about these two surfaces with arrows and so forth. How do we make that happen in a real system with a real real mechanical equipment and you'll see this in the movie in just a second but what you're looking at well, I can't see it from here it's okay farther away you can see it so you've got you've got a rotating core and on the sides of that you have these fins nice beefy metallic fins and they're sitting inside this circular cage and the key thing is that this distance here between those guys and that outer wall is tiny, is small. And so this is where these lines of laminar flow meet, that this guy's going that way, the ones on the inside are going the other way, and that's where those, those arrows intersect and drag force is generated. And then as a result, you end up ejecting things out through these circular holes here around the edge of this. So it, it draws things into itself from below and then blasts them through this type of drag force based mixing at the interfaces between one metal surface and another metal surface. And the smaller this distance is, the more efficient the process is. is. All right, and that should make some sense too. If those arrows meet in a short, small distance, then the shear becomes very large. All right, so that's what that looks like blown up but let me show you the move oh, hold on 
and get rid of that. Hopefully the movie will come on. Ugh. Always a struggle. All right, so uh, as I said before, I have this movie posted on the on Carmen. If anybody has any ideas about how to download download YouTube videos, let me know. Let me see if I can. This is just giving you some introductory music. And this is how you convert oranges into orange juice. And how you make oil and water rolls from that should not exist. Very high energy process, right? Hope you get a sense of that. So this is kind of showing you the workforce itself. The small holes, the blades moving very quickly, drawing stuff into itself. Since 1948, oh. Silverson have been leaders a, a, a in the development very of high speed, high shear mixers, supplying uh, customers the, um, throughout the world. Let's see. This is just showing you again that that thing moving and the uh, type of rotation I talked about. And they give you this one example here uh, where they take sugar and water and they use the mixer we have downstairs in the basement. Disintegrate, sugar and dissolve water. and homogenize at the same and time. Yeah, eventually it'll mix In this demonstration, water. sugar crystals are stirred by a conventional agitator. It's gonna take a long time. The ingredients right. very quickly very begin big. to move as a single body. And although the crystals will eventually dissolve, a high shear mixer can achieve the same results in a matter of seconds. Right, so so how is the high shear mixer able to do this? Breaks these things the up high speed rotation of the rotor exerts kind of a powerful suction, drawing solution. liquid and solid and materials like upwards into the workhead. The same thing, Centrifugal force and then they, drives the materials towards the periphery this, of the workhead, tight, where they're rapidly mixing, milled between the rotor blades and the stator. This is followed by intense hydraulic shear as the materials are forced out through the perforations and back into the mix. Oh, this does show you oil and water. On the left-hand side is a standard blade, on the right-hand side is the Silvison mixer. Stirrer or agitator. And, um, you know, you obviously it looks the a little more genius on the right-hand side than the other. of the machine being switched off. Come on. And then, importantly, when and you turn it off, you can see liquids. the one on the right. Uh, With is, the conventional stirrer, is, whoops, thickening agents, right, for example, uh, must be on. added. One on the right is staying homogeneous, and the one on the left is, is separating, which is what you'd expect from oil and water. And so this, this overcomes the uh, oil and water repulsion we always hear about. You make an emulsion out of it, and it's stable. Otherwise, you don't get mixing at all. And so this is just some more examples. Again, if you want to look at this, they have, uh, where is it on the web? Uh, again, on the website, they have the example of, where is it? Uh, somewhere in here, they have the giant one. Anyway, they have a huge one of these that's used to convert oranges into into slurry in just a second or two. It's pretty amazing. Oh, there it is. Twenty thousand. Seen here, instantly just popping oranges. Blast apart oranges. It's used for reducing and homogenizing <laughs> large solids in a single operation. All right. Originally developed for the disintegration. Come on. All right. Any questions about that? Hopefully you have a good idea of how this process works and why we have to use it as well. Why is this, this extreme mixing necessary? So what we're doing in the end is trying to, well, that's weird, destroy agglomerates and mix organics. And in the end, we want to achieve and maintain a perfectly distributed dispersion. All right, so this, this requires us to kind of define what our goals are. And you've already seen the initial state out of the bag or out of the barrel of the alumina. And what we're thinking about now is these value judgments, obviously, that define where it is we want to be as far as these particles. And so we initially have um, a bad dispersion and a bad distribution. And by, the, by bad in this context, you can see that the particles are stuck to each other. They're in the energy well. No, we don't like that. We also have a bad distribution in that they are kind of you know, spread, not uniformly, but they're lumps floating around in suspension. And as a result of that, I don't know what that is. Okay, fine, do it. Uh, as a, oh, I guess I'm not going to use that color anymore. Uh, as a result of that, you can get sedimentation, meaning that gravity will act on these and pull them to the bottom. All right, and that's a classic example of a dispersion that isn't really a dispersion, and you can't injection mold out of it because these agglomerates are too big. They, 
they stick together, they block things, um, and certainly there'll be large flaws in between them. Uh, somewhat more desirable is uh, what's called a bad dispersion, but a good distribution. So what you've done is you've taken the matter and you kind of uniformly distribute it. All right, and that's not too bad, but unfortunately, you know, they're still stuck together. They're still in the energy well. And so this could be an initial agglomerate that you, you throw enough energy at it, you break it up, but the individual particles are still agglomerated together. All right, and in the absence of uh, processing additive, these guys will just lump right back up again into hard agglomerates, for example, which is what it looks like. All right, so that's, that's not desirable either. What we then can have is what's called a good dispersion and a bad distribution, which is getting closer to where we'd like to be. First off, what we've done is we've put space in between these particles. All right, so they're soft agglomerates now, all right, meaning that the flaw sizes that result from this are going to be less. And then the ultimate goal we do the best of both worlds where we have good dispersion and good distribution. So not only do we put space between the ultimate particles, but we disperse them uniformly throughout the entire batch. And this is the goal. The reality is, is somewhat in between these two. All right? We're usually somewhere between these two endpoints. Uh, we might be on the right-hand side, but as soon as we stop shearing, it starts to go toward the left, for example. That would be a, a standard way of thinking about this. Because as you remember that little Death Star video of the particles going in and out of the huge agglomerate, you know, that's all going on. These things don't just sit there and frozen in space. They keep acting. So during the initial state of the mixing, the state of the binder components changes from solid slash liquid to semi-fluid to liquid. So they start out with chunks of, of polymer, chunks of ceramic, solid and liquid, and then you start blending things together in sort of a useful way but then you really get to the true fluid state where there aren't any visible components of either. Mixing at this final stage involves inner diffusion because we're talking about polymer chains and plasticizers and other things. Mutual solubility of the binder components and the interaction of the binder with the surfaces of the ceramic powder. All right, so again, if we don't have that key interaction of the ceramic powder with the batch around it, then we don't get the goal. We don't get anything at all uh, because there's no there's no um, favorable process going on here so if we have our our particle again we have alumina and we put uh, I mentioned this last time we can put steric acid on it all right and steric acid is, is wonderful stuff because it consists of the carboxylate we talked about last time, which will attract it to the, the aluminum surface. And then out here we have CH2-16, and then on the end we have CH3. All right, and this is wonderful stuff. It's made by plants and animals. It exists in animal fat, it exists in, in um, palm oil. You can get it really cheaply, and it's exactly what you need, which is this, this Segment of polyethylene, wonderful, all right? It's cheap too, and so it does exactly what it needs to do and makes everything else possible. Even with all this mechanical technology, if we didn't have that, we, we still wouldn't be where we need to be. When is the necessary degree of mixedness attained? Again, it's, it's unfortunately trial and error. You know, we, we can visually look at a batch, it seems homogeneous, not necessarily there until you check the properties. Agglomerates will continue to form, both as a consequence of change in interfacial tension between the particles of the ceramic powder and the binder, and as the entire mix becomes a viscous mass. And so this is where um, that flow chart that talked about staging of additions, you know, when do you add things, that's key in this process. Subsequent mixing is only dispersive beyond that point, and so you're trying to just blend things homogeneously. In the absence of continued shear, time, stability is time dependent. Um, and so we talk about this as being this concept of, of lattice of sedimentation, where you remember the lattice where all the particles are homogeneously distributed, they're not touching each other, they're not even agglomerated. And over time, once you turn the shear off, things change, all right? This is active. Eventually, at some point, it'll start to sediment. But you know, your job is to make stuff before that happens before that becomes too extreme. 
All right, any questions about that? This is how we get it done. And so the mixing process in all of this is highly concentration, or condition, I'm sorry, concentration as well, dependent. And what I've got here are four plots, um, all of which start with two constant things. 50 volume percent alumina, all right, which you now know is actually not that challenging in the scheme of things. It's not 70 or 80 percent volume alumina. And we're also at 200 RPMs. All right, those are the constants through all four of these plots. And uh, we're working with polyethylene, um, which melts, you know, depends on the molecular weight, but melts at kind of the lowest condition on this. So here are 125, 150, 175, and 220 degrees C. So we have the same polymer, same alumina, same RPMs associated with this process, and same total solids content. Why is there, well first off, let's, let's start from the beginning. We start by, this is time on the x-axis, we start mixing and mixing, and at some point we have a, a very high torque excursion, let's call it that. And so we have the, the torque on the system suddenly increases. And what that means is the alumina and the polymers are all going into this mixing cage and it has to work really hard to tear down agglomerates. And that's what's happening here, agglomerate destruction and mixing as well. Okay. So everything gets sucked into it and now it has to work really hard to, because it's dealing with this polymer and these ceramics. Okay, so that's, that's happening and then after that things kind of settle down because you've dispersed it, all right? You've gotten at least to, you know, uh, maybe bad dispersion, good distribution, something like that, all right? So now the viscosity has dropped off, you've got your mixing achieved, you're kind of good to go, all right? But why does it change so much? if we go from 125 to 150. So we go from 700 to maybe 350, and then 175, it's a, not about 150, and then 220, it's not even that. It's whatever that is, 20 or 30, something like that. Why the big change? At least a couple of reasons here. Yes. Heat means polymer motion. Heat means polymer motion, exactly. So um, polymer chains, when they get hot, they move better. All right. And what does that mean here? Easier mixing. Because? No, you don't have this. You have a less viscous polymer. Less viscous. All right, bingo. All right, so we've dramatically dropped off the viscosity by increasing the temperature from 125 to 220. And so that's to do with relative polymer motion. All right, and that's important, as you say, from in terms of viscosity. Why else would relative polymer motion be helpful to us beyond just the, the interactions of polymers with themselves? As those chains move around faster and more efficiently, what else are they doing besides not having a high viscosity? Yeah. Printing the formation of agglomerates. How do they do that? If they're constantly moving, then it makes it harder for uh, the, the particles to hit each other. Uh, well, uh, that's true, but let, let's look at the energy state here, this, this torque excursion. What, why does that drop off so much? I mean, after you, what you just said is absolutely true after what that excursion is done. But that excursion itself, it's, you know, it's it's dramatically reduced from beginning to end. So the polymer chains can move faster and move more efficiently. They can get in between these ceramic particles faster and more efficiently, all right? And so that's also a key aspect of this. And in doing so, the viscosity goes down, that's right, but they also get in between the particles, meaning that this dar syllabus and mixa doesn't have to work as hard to get in there and rip those particles apart because the polymer chains are already going in there for us. Okay, 
And so this is all dependent on how the polymer behaves as a function of temperature along with all the machinery and metallurgy and energy we throw at the system. Okay. And this is why in the end, you know, we often end up injection molding out here at 220 rather than trying to do it at 125 because this has to also go through a tiny little hole, a tiny little gate to get into the mold. And this probably wouldn't go through that tiny little hole, not at least under, under reasonable pressures. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so different mixing techniques. Three types of mixers are used. Um, you have dispersive or Banbury mixers, and this is uh, showing you one example of that. So this guy, we used to have one of these in the basement. This is like six foot tall by three feet wide. All right, so that's the scale of these things that are uh, at work here, where we have these rotating heads or rotating um, containers that go past each other and go past an adjacent metal surface at high rates. We also have uh, rolling mills, um, and that's kind of an example of this here. And this is still used in the industry. They take various powders, polymers and ceramics, run them in between these rotating drums, and this only shows you three drums. There could be a lot more than three. And in the end, you make a tape by doing this, this mixing over short length scales. Anybody know what, what this tape can be? We don't use it very much anymore. Used to use it a lot. So you take, make this magnetite and uh, polyethylene terephthalate, and you end up making recording tape at the other end. Right, we still use some, of, some recording tape. But you know, this is how you can make nice composites by getting the right type of mixing. And the kind of thing that we're talking about today is internal mixers. Uniformly dispersed ceramic powder with a binder after it has been well mixed with a polymer phase. And so this is showing you the guts of this, one example. And so you've got this one knuckle-like object and the, another one that's the same thing, and they're inside of a, a metal surface, and you have these very small distances. All right. And so everything's spinning very quickly, and the smaller those distances are, the better. All right, this is where you, know, you want to try to get them really close to each other, but they shouldn't bang into each other, which is really bad when that happens. And so you know, precision engineering becomes very important because that's where the real mixing, the one that we want to have happen, is actually taking place. And so these guys on a lab scale look like that. You know, these are a few inches long. Of course, on an inch scale, they'll be more like that. They'll be feet in size. So it depends on what you're making. And um, so, yeah, um, you get, as it says, different types of mixing and dispersing conditions, choosing a specific head. There's a lot of art to this. Some people swear by one head versus some other head. Truly dispersed the mixing, however, takes place mainly in the flight clearance H2, and that's shown more clearly here. So we have these things spinning inside some other metallurgical container and we have one distance H1 but then we also have this other distance H2 which is doing a lot of the really hard work all right, of pulling everything apart and making sure we try to get a good dispersion and a good distribution. That's that, that magic, if you want to call it that, is happening here and not really anywhere else. And so the faster it spins, the shorter, smaller H2 is, the better off we are. Laminar mixing takes place mainly in flight clearance H1, which is just generalized mixing of everything inside this. Distributed mixing takes place in an axial direction, partly within the channels and partly in the free volume and the mixing head. So you, you break things down here at H2, and then H1 takes the products of what's broken down, mix it with everything else, and then there's further mixing happening along the axial direction. So these are very efficient in terms of what they do in a small space. And then um, we start to scale this up and you can see that these can be very complex objects. The BNP co-kneader, a low shear rotating and reciprocating single screw extruder designed for shear and temperature sensitive compounds. The flights in the screw are interrupted by and interact with three rows of stationary kneading pins located in the barrel wall. All right, so what you've got is this central shaft, which can be feet long, all right, 
and it's sitting inside this overall cage and within the walls of that cage you have these little green pins they're not actually green in the real machine this is just calling them out and those pins happen to fit in between those fins on the main barrel all right and this this spins at 200 or whatever rpms and it gets you that type of uh, again small distances lots of shear if we try to do this with alumina um, alumina will wear the hell out of something that's made out of metal. You might make this out of ceramic instead, which has been done. Hideously expensive when you do it, but it is a possibility because of what you're dealing with. You can't, you can't use steel and alumina. Pretty soon there won't be any steel left. The alumina will still be there, but the steel will be gone because it, it abrades the steel very quickly. But you know, this gives you an idea of, of what it is we're talking about. These are not trivial things to make. All right, so... Um, yeah, as we discussed, we have electrostatic forces, Van der Waals, hydrogen bonding, uh, absorb water, remove the water, at least some of it, and then add the processing aids. Again, I, I can't overemphasize this enough. You know, these need to be there in order to make everything else work. And then you go to the mixing process involving things like oleic acid, stearic acid, the mid-hot and fish oil. They help break down the process. Agglomerates also form as different bi... One... Okay. Uh, ingredients are added. The force used to divide a simple agglomerate shape is given by F max being equal to 3 pi eta, the viscosity, and this gamma dot again is our shear rate, and then two things, R1 and R2, which are the radii of the two individual particles. All right, and therefore the maximum force is proportional to first off eta times gamma dot, so oops, eta and gamma dot basically being the energy we're pouring into the system and the viscosity which is controlled by molecular weight and then R1 and R2 okay and the the issue here is that R1 and R2 may both be relatively large to begin with so you've got this 100 micron hard agglomerate pretty big in the scheme of things you actually see 100 micron agglomerates with your naked eye all right, but then as we become successful, R1 and R2 start to drop off dramatically. All right, and that's where it becomes very hard to maintain a high maximum force between two particles when those particles become very small. So this is kind of the milling limit for the system because you can only exert so much force with a given shear rate and a given viscosity when R1 and R2 become very small. So eventually, the process efficiency drops off to zero when you are successful, but hopefully that gives you a, a batch that you can injection mold. Any questions about that? All right, so again, he's out of the well and we're mixing them together very efficiently. And so this gets into some of the details. Um, some of this is from Battelle. The highest loading is called the critical powder concentration and that's desired because again you're trying to get to 50, 60, 70, maybe 80 percent solids concentrations, concentrations. And you can plot the applied torque necessary to achieve a given RPM. So at a certain temperature, at a certain viscosity, um, there's a certain amount of energy you have to throw in the system to rip everything apart and make something that's useful. Um, and so this just shows you some data for a couple of different batches a uh, zirconia and then alumina a16 super grind which i mentioned before and it also shows you this in this case not as a function of time but as a function of oleic acid content so the stuff sitting on the surface and so what you can see is that as we increase the oleic acid content um, the amount of torque gradually builds and at some maximum value all right we're getting what we want we're getting this destruction of the agglomerates and dispersion by the, the organic additives around it. And then, after that, the amount of energy drops off. Why is that? So, this guy is doing the work of getting the parts, particles away from each other. And beyond that, all right, it's not really necessary anymore. It, it, some people say it's overdoing it. But anyway, the amount of energy necessary becomes less because the oleic acid is doing more of the work to tear things apart. So this is too little, too little, too little, 
and then we get to the right amount, and then beyond that, then we have to do less torque to cause the same thing to happen, to rip these particles away from each other and introduce a layer that keeps them in the, uh, the soft agglomerate state. Okay, and so this kind of outlines the balance between chemistry and uh, mechanical force. And so this is just showing this binder content of various powders. Again, the A16 super grind, 65%, all right, 71% for zirconia, 56%. And so these are the kinds of solids contents that we're talking about. And of course, this is Battelle Columbus. And uh, now the numbers are, you know, 10, 20% higher than that in industry. That's old data. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about is um, the um, another issue that relates to what we're talking about here, which is the fact that we have a uh, very high solids content, and we know we want a very high solids content because that makes our flaw sizes smaller, all right? Um, but it does something else for us as well, and this is ceramic powder loading and shrinkage. And this is, a, when I say shrinkage, I mean centering shrinkage. So we say we shoot apart and uh, say we really know what the heck we're doing and it's 75% dense, right? Without, without any, being anywhere near a furnace, it's already 75% dense. And we have to, as you know, remove all that polymer that we spent so much time introducing. We now have to get rid of it. Um, and when we do that, we'll talk about more uh, that process more later. But uh, when we remove it and start to undergo sintering, we are removing all the pore space and causing what we've injection molded to shrink. And this is related to the, this is kind of gibberish here, the uh, volume fraction of the ceramic powder in the mix. And so we have this powder versus the overall volume times the specific gravity of that particular powder, where this rho sub g is the green density of the as molded parts, V sub P is a volume fraction of powder, and V sub M is the total volume, and S sub GP, SGP is a specific gravity of powder. What we're really focused on here is the, the shrinkage during sintering. And uh, what I'm showing you here is a classic relationship between a linear shrinkage, delta L over L, which is important to us because we can measure this. We can put this, this part in the dilatometer, and we can figure out delta L over L. And then we can then, with this particular formula, relate that to delta V over V, which is much more difficult to do on a practical basis. Linear shrinkage is not so bad. Volumetric shrinkage can be a real pain. And so we have this expression for delta L over L, where the delta L part of it is first squared and then cubed. And uh, this is related to, again, this uh, green density, the, the final solids density, the theoretical density in both cases and so forth and so on. So these are the kinds of things that we worry about and where this becomes really important to us is in how this controls the process of shrinkage. And so I've mentioned before that we're making these complex shapes, these, these implant shapes with threading and who knows what kinds of shapes in them as well. Um, and we don't like to machine these at all if we can avoid it. It's impossible to not avoid some of it. But machining a ceramic is very expensive and very slow, and your boss hates both of those things. I mean, so we want something that is going to go undergo at least the minimum amount of shrinkage because that means that the shape is unlikely to change. Ideally, it would be the same shape after injection molding post-sintering, but we know it's got to shrink some, all right? And that shrinkage process, especially if it's not a ball, all right, it's going to make things move around relative to each other. And so what we're looking at is this interplay between this wonderful thing we can do, which is use really high densities, and the necessary thing we, we need to do, which is center it. And so minimizing shrinkage is important to maintaining dimensional control. And this, you know, again, relates to money downstream from that. As the initial solids content increases, linear shrinkage or the deformation or potential for deformation decreases. All right, and that should make sense. <laughs> and then ultimately the final achievable density will also increase. And so this is showing you a really interesting plot, which is related to that previous equation, um, in which we start with different volume fractions of solids, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80% solids. 
and we look at the um, percent linear shrinkage necessary to get to specific final center densities. And so we know from the biomaterials perspective, we would love to be at 0.9999, if not, if not better than that. All right, 0.999 means the flaw sizes are as small, at least we think they're as small as we can possibly make them. And so we'd really like to get to that outer curve. At the same time though, we don't want this to shrink too much because shrinking just means it's, it's changing shape and so forth. And so what we're then looking at is the fact that if we start with say 40 volume percent fraction, which is pretty pitiful in the scheme of things in terms of injection molding density, in order to get to this, this final 0.99, you know, we're looking at you know, more than 25% shrinkage. And so that's, that's a lot of dimensional change that can happen. Doesn't sound like much, but it's a lot. And again, that can cause things to twist and torque and warp and become slightly different shapes than we'd like them to be. And so it's expensive to, to fix that problem. The other side of the coin, of course, is that we can go to 80% solids loading, 70% solids loading. These are typical, all right? So we're above body centered cubic packing densities, but we still have a fluid that ideally makes a solid that sits at those densities. And then the nice thing about that is if we start at 70% and we're trying to get to 99, we have a 10% shrinkage. Or we start at 80% and we're trying to get to 99, then we have only 5% shrinkage. All right. So it's a big payoff if we can do it. Um, so um, that looks good. It's a great story. And this course is the goal. But the practical side of this is uh, not as uh, pliable as we'd like it to be, let's call it that. Because what often happens, if you're running at 80% solid density, which is, which is pushing it, all right, this, this is a nice relationship, nice thing to draw on the board. But along with this is the fact that you have to injection mold these. You have to shoot these fluids into a complex shape and they have to go everywhere and make the shape that you want. And so when you run up to these high fluid densities, you end up creating a problem in that the injection molding process may not be successful most of the time. You can have a, like a 70% rejection rate, meaning that 70% of what comes out of that gets thrown away or ideally recycled and only 30% becomes useful product, okay? Um, which is acceptable because it's, it's biomedicine. You're charging $1,000 for each one of those final products. All right, so you can make up your costs associated with that if you're spending, if someone's gonna pay you that much money for this alumina femoral head that you've been making. All right, you can, you can, you can deal with that. Probably very few other places can you deal with a 70% rejection rate. It's crazy, but with the money involved, it works in biomedicine. Are there any questions about all that? Um, I'm going to post some old exams on the Carmen website so you guys get a sense of the challenge that lies before you. All right. Um, and you can start to struggle with some of these concepts ahead of time. All right. Any questions about all this? Um, so we class on Monday, right? Okay. You guys have a good weekend.